The Battle of Berlin, designated the Berlin Strategic Offensive Operation by the Soviet Union, and also known as the Fall of Berlin, was the final major offensive of the European theater of World War II. Following the Vistula Oder Offensive of January to February 1945, the Red Army had temporarily halted on a line 60 kilometers (37 miles) east of Berlin. On the 9th of March, Germany established its defense plan for the city with Operation Clausewitz. The first defensive preparations at the outskirts of Berlin were made on 20 March, under the newly appointed commander of Army Group Vistula, General Gothard Heinrichi. When the Soviet offensive resumed on 16 April, two Soviet fronts Army groups attacked Berlin from the east and south, while a third overran German forces positioned north of Berlin. Before the main battle in Berlin commenced, the Red Army encircled the city after successful battles of the Silo Heights and Halb. On 20 April 1945, Hitler's birthday, the first Belarusian front led by Marshal Georgi Zhukov, advancing from the east and north, started shelling Berlin's city center, while Marshal Ivan Konev's first Ukrainian front broke through Army Group Center and advanced towards the southern suburbs of Berlin. On 23 April General Helmuth Weidling assumed command of the forces within Berlin. The garrison consisted of several depleted and disorganized Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS divisions, along with poorly trained Volkstrom and Hitler Youth members. Over the course of the next week, the Red Army gradually took the entire city. Before the battle was over, Hitler and several of his followers killed themselves. The city's garrison surrendered on 2 May but fighting continued to the northwest, west, and southwest of the city until the end of the war in Europe on 8 May, the 9th of May in the Soviet Union as some German units fought westward so that they could surrender to the Western Allies rather than to the Soviets. <laughs> <laughs> Background Starting on 12 January 1945, the Red Army began the Vistula Oder Offensive across the Nauru River, and, from Warsaw, a three-day operation on a broad front, which incorporated four army fronts. On the fourth day, the Red Army broke out and started moving west, up to 30 to 40 kilometers 19 to 25 miles per day, taking East Prussia, Danzig, and Poznan, drawing up on a line 60 kilometers 37 miles east of Berlin along the Oder River. The newly created Army Group Vistula, under the command of Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler, attempted a counterattack, but this had failed by 24 February. The Red Army then drove onto Pomerania, clearing the right bank of the Oder River, thereby reaching into Silesia. In the south, the Siege of Budapest raged. Three German divisions' attempts to relieve the encircled Hungarian capital city failed, and Budapest fell to the Soviets on 13 February. Adolf Hitler insisted on a counterattack to recapture the Draw Danube Triangle. The goal was to secure the oil region of Nagykaniza and regain the Danube River for future operations, but the depleted German forces had been given an impossible task. By 16 March, the German Lake Balaton offensive had failed, and a counterattack by the Red Army took back in 24 hours everything the Germans had taken 10 days to gain. On 30 March, the Soviets entered Austria, and in the Vienna Offensive they captured Vienna on 13 April. Between June and September 1944, the Wehrmacht had lost more than a million men, and it lacked the fuel and armaments needed to operate effectively. On 12 April 1945, Hitler, who had earlier decided to remain in the city against the wishes of his advisers, heard the news that the American president Franklin D. Roosevelt had died. This briefly raised false hopes in the fear bunker that there might yet be a falling out among the Allies and that Berlin would be saved at the last moment, as had happened once before when Berlin was threatened see the miracle of the House of Brandenburg, no plans were made by the Western Allies to seize the city by a ground operation. The Supreme Commander Western Allied Expeditionary Force, General Eisenhower lost interest in the race to Berlin and saw no further need to suffer casualties by attacking a city that would be in the Soviet sphere of influence after the war, envisioning excessive friendly fire if both armies attempted to occupy the city at once. The major Western Allied contribution to the battle was the bombing of Berlin during 1945. During 1945 the United States Army Air Forces launched very large daytime raids on Berlin and for 36 nights in succession, scores of RAF mosquitoes bombed the German capital, ending on the night of 2021 April 1945 just before the Soviets entered the city. Preparations 
The Soviet offensive into central Germany, what later became East Germany, had two objectives. Stalin did not believe the Western Allies would hand over territory occupied by them in the post-war Soviet zone, so he began the offensive on a broad front and moved rapidly to meet the Western Allies as far west as possible. But the overriding objective was to capture Berlin. The two goals were complementary because possession of the zone could not be won quickly unless Berlin were taken. Another consideration was that Berlin itself held useful post-war strategic assets, including Adolf Hitler and the German atomic bomb program. On 6 March, Hitler appointed Lieutenant General Helmuth Rehmann commander of the Berlin Defense Area, replacing Lieutenant General Bruno Ritter von Hauenschild. On 20 March, General Gothard Heinrichi was appointed commander-in-chief of Army Group Vistula replacing Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler. Heinrichi was one of the best defensive tacticians in the German army, and he immediately started to lay defensive plans. Heinrichi correctly assessed that the main Soviet thrust would be made over the Oder River and along the main east-west Autobahn. He decided not to try to defend the banks of the Oder with anything more than a light skirmishing screen. Instead, Heinrichi arranged for engineers to fortify the Silo Heights, which overlooked the Oder River at the point where the Autobahn crossed them. This was some distance 17 kilometers 11 miles west of the Oder and 90 kilometers 56 miles east of Berlin. Heinrichi thinned out the line in other areas to increase the manpower available to defend the heights. German engineers turned the Oder's flood plain, already saturated by the spring thaw, into a swamp by releasing the water from a reservoir upstream. Behind the plain on the plateau, the engineers built three belts of defensive emplacements reaching back towards the outskirts of Berlin the lines nearer to Berlin were called the Wotan position. These lines consisted of anti-tank ditches, anti-tank gun emplacements, and an extensive network of trenches and bunkers. On the 9th of April, after a long resistance, Königsberg in East Prussia fell to the Red Army. This freed up Marshal Rokossovsky's Second Belarusian Front to move west to the east bank of the Oder River. Marshal Georgi Zhukov concentrated his First Belarusian Front, which had been deployed along the Oder River from Frankfurt in the south to the Baltic, into an area in front of the Silo Heights. The second Belarusian front moved into the positions being vacated by the first Belarusian front north of the Silo Heights. While this redeployment was in progress, gaps were left in the lines, and the remnants of General Dietrich von Sacken's German II Army, which had been bottled up in a pocket near Danzig, managed to escape into the Vistula Delta. To the south, Marshal Konev shifted the main weight of the 1st Ukrainian Front out of Upper Silesia and northwest to the Nice River. The three Soviet fronts had altogether 2.5 million men, including 78,556 soldiers of the 1st Polish Army, 6,250 tanks, 7,500 aircraft, 41,600 artillery pieces and mortars, 3,255 truck mounted Katyusha rocket launchers, nicknamed Stalin's pipe organs, and 95,000. 1,383 motor vehicles, many manufactured in the U.S. <inaudible> Battle of the oder nice The sector in which most of the fighting in the overall offensive took place was the Silo Heights, the last major defensive line outside Berlin. The Battle of the Silo Heights, fought over four days from 16 April until 19 April, was one of the last pitched battles of World War II. Almost one million Red Army soldiers and more than 20,000 tanks and artillery pieces were deployed to break through the gates to Berlin, which were defended by about 100,000 German soldiers and 1,200 tanks and guns. The Soviet forces led by Zhukov broke through the defensive positions, having suffered about 30,000 dead, while 12,000 German personnel were killed. During 19 April, the fourth day, the 1st Belarusian Front broke through the final line of the Silo Heights, and nothing but broken German formations lay between them and Berlin. The 1st Ukrainian Front, having captured force the day before, was fanning out into open country. One powerful thrust by Gordo's 3rd Guards Army and Rybalko's 3rd and Lelyashenko's 4th Guards tank armies were heading northeast towards Berlin while other armies headed west towards a section of the United States Army's front line southwest of Berlin on the Elbe. With these advances, the Soviet forces drove a wedge between the German Army Group Vistula in the north and Army Group Center in the south. By the end of the day, the German Eastern Front line north of Frankfurt around Silo and to the south around Forst had ceased to exist. 
These breakthroughs allowed the two Soviet fronts to envelop the German Ninth Army in a large pocket west of Frankfurt. Attempts by the Ninth Army to break out to the west resulted in the Battle of Halb. The cost to the Soviet forces had been very high, with over 2,807 tanks lost between 1 and 19 April, including at least 727 at the Silo Heights. In the meantime, RAF Mosquitoes were conducting large tactical air raids against German positions inside Berlin on the nights of 15 April 105 bombers, 17 April 61 bombers, 18 April 57 bombers, 19 April 79 bombers, and 20 April 78 bombers. Topic. Encirclement of Berlin On 20 April 1945, Hitler's 56th birthday, Soviet artillery of the First Belarusian Front began shelling Berlin and did not stop until the city surrendered. The weight of ordnance delivered by Soviet artillery during the battle was greater than the total tonnage dropped by Western Allied bombers on the city. While the 1st Belarusian Front advanced towards the east and northeast of the city, the 1st Ukrainian Front pushed through the last formations of the northern wing of Army Group Center and passed north of Juderbog, well over halfway to the American front line on the River Elbe at Magdeburg. To the north between Stettin and Schwedt, the 2nd Belarusian Front attacked the northern flank of Army Group Vistula, held by Hasso von Mantufel's 3 Panzer Army. The next day, Bogdanov's 2nd Guards tank army advanced nearly 50 kilometers 31 miles north of Berlin and then attacked southwest of Wernicken. The Soviet plan was to encircle Berlin first and then envelop the Ix army. The command of the German V Corps, trapped with the Ix army north of Forst, passed from the IV Panzer Army to the Ix army. The Corps was still holding on to the berlin kopis highway front line. Field Marshal Ferdinand Schorner's Army Group Center launched a counter-offensive aimed at breaking through to Berlin from the south and making a successful initial incursion the Battle of Bautzen in the 1st Ukrainian Front region, engaging the 2nd Polish Army and elements of the Red Army's 52nd Army and 5th Guards Army. When the old southern flank of the IV Panzer Army had some local successes counter-attacking north against the 1st Ukrainian Front, Hitler gave orders that showed his grasp of military reality was completely gone. He ordered the Ix army to hold Cottbus and set up a front facing west. Then they were to attack the Soviet columns advancing north. This would supposedly allow them to form a northern pincer that would meet the IV Panzer army coming from the south and envelop the 1st Ukrainian front before destroying it. They were to anticipate a southward attack by the 3 Panzer army and be ready to be the southern arm of a pincer attack that would envelop 1st Belarusian Front, which would be destroyed by SS General Felix Steiner's army detachment advancing from north of Berlin. Later in the day, when Steiner explained that he did not have the divisions to do this, Heinrichi made it clear to Hitler's staff that unless the Ix army retreated immediately, it would be enveloped by the Soviets. He stressed that it was already too late for it to move northwest to Berlin and would have to retreat west. Heinrichi went on to say that if Hitler did not allow it to move west, he would ask to be relieved of his command. On the 22nd of April 1945, at his afternoon situation conference, Hitler fell into a tearful rage, famously dramatized in the 2004 German film Downfall, when he realized that his plans, prepared the previous day, could not be achieved. He declared that the war was lost, blaming the generals for the defeat and that he would remain in Berlin until the end and then kill himself. In an attempt to coax Hitler out of his rage, General Alfred Jodl speculated that General Walther Wenck's 12th Army, which was facing the Americans, could move to Berlin because the Americans, already on the Elbe River, were unlikely to move further east. This assumption was based on his viewing of the captured Eclipse documents, which organized the partition of Germany among the Allies. Hitler immediately grasped the idea, and within hours Wenck was ordered to disengage from the Americans and move the 12th Army northeast to support Berlin. It was then realized that if the Ix Army moved west, it could link up with the 12th Army. In the evening Heinrichi was given permission to make the link up. Elsewhere, the 2nd Belarusian Front had established a bridgehead 15 kilometers 9 miles deep on the west bank of the Oder and was heavily engaged with the 3 Panzer Army. The Ix army had lost Cottbus and was being pressed from the east. A Soviet tank spearhead was on the Havel River to the east of Berlin, and another had at one point penetrated the inner defensive ring of Berlin. The capital was now within range of field artillery. 
A Soviet war correspondent, in the style of World War II Soviet journalism, gave the following account of an important event which took place on the 22nd of April 1945 at 8.30 local time. On the walls of the houses we saw Goebbels' appeals, hurriedly scrawled in white paint, every German will defend his capital. We shall stop the red hordes at the walls of our Berlin. Just try and stop them, steel pillboxes, barricades, mines, traps, suicide squads with grenades clutched in their hands. All are swept aside before the tidal wave. Drizzling rain began to fall. Near Bisdorf I saw batteries preparing to open fire. What are the targets? I asked the battery commander. Center of Berlin, Spree Bridges, and the Northern and Stettin Railway Stations, he answered. Then came the tremendous words of command, open fire on the capital of fascist Germany. I noted the time. It was exactly 8.30 a.m. on the 22nd of April. Ninety-six shells fell in the center of Berlin in the course of a few minutes. On 23 April 1945, the Soviet First Belarusian Front and First Ukrainian Front continued to tighten the encirclement, severing the last link between the German Ix army and the city. Elements of the First Ukrainian Front continued to move westward and started to engage the German 12th Army moving towards Berlin. On this same day, Hitler appointed General Helmut Weidling as the commander of the Berlin Defense Area, replacing Lieutenant General Raymond. Meanwhile, by 24 April 1945 elements of First Belarusian Front and First Ukrainian Front had completed the encirclement of the city. Within the next day, 25 April 1945, the Soviet investment of Berlin was consolidated, with leading Soviet units probing and penetrating the S-Bahn defensive ring. By the end of the day, it was clear that the German defense of the city could not do anything but temporarily delay the capture of the city by the Soviets, since the decisive stages of the battle had already been fought and lost by the Germans outside the city. By that time, Schorner's offensive, initially successful, had mostly been thwarted, although he did manage to inflict significant casualties on the opposing Polish and Soviet units, slowing down their progress. <laughs> <laughs> Battle in Berlin The forces available to General Weidling for the city's defense included roughly 45,000 soldiers in several severely depleted German Army and Waffen-SS divisions. These divisions were supplemented by the police force, boys in the compulsory Hitler Youth, and the Volkstrom. Many of the 40,000 elderly men of the Volkstrom had been in the army as young men and some were veterans of World War I. Hitler appointed SS Brigadefuhrer Wilhelm Monk the battle commander for the central government district that included the Reich Chancellery and Führbunker. He had over 2,000 men under his command. Weidling organized the defenses into eight sectors designated a through to H, each one commanded by a colonel or a general, but most had no combat experience. To the west of the city was the 20th Infantry Division. To the north of the city was the 9th Parachute Division. To the northeast of the city was the Panzer Division Munchaberg. To the southeast of the city and to the east of Tempelhof Airport was the 11th SS Panzergrenadier Division Nordland. The reserve, 18th Panzergrenadier Division, was in Berlin's Central District. On 23 April, Berzeran's 5th Shock Army and Katakov's 1st Guards Tank Army assaulted Berlin from the southeast and, after overcoming a counterattack by the German 56th Panzer Corps, reached the Berlin S Bahn Ring Railway on the north side of the Teltow Canal by the evening of 24 April. During the same period, of all the German forces ordered to reinforce the inner defences of the city by Hitler, only a small contingent of French SS volunteers under the command of SS Brigadefuhrer Gustav Krukenberg arrived in Berlin. During 25 April, Krukenberg was appointed as the commander of Defence Sector C, the sector under the most pressure from the Soviet assault on the city. On 26 April, Chuikov's 8th Guards Army and the 1st Guards Tank Army fought their way through the southern suburbs and attacked Tempelhof Airport, just inside the S-Bahn defensive ring, where they met stiff resistance from the Munchaberg Division. But by 27 April, the two understrength divisions Munchaberg and Nordland that were defending the southeast, now facing five Soviet armies, from east to west, the 5th Shock Army, the 8th Guards Army, the 1st Guards Tank Army and Rybalko's 3rd Guards Tank Army part of the 1st Ukrainian Front, were forced back towards the center, taking up new defensive positions around Hermannplatz. Krukenberg informed General Hans Krebs, chief of the General Staff of OKH that within 24 hours the Nordland would have to fall back to the center Sector Z for Zentrum. 
The Soviet advance to the city center was along these main axes, from the southeast, along the Frankfurter Allee ending and stopped at the Alexanderplatz, from the south along Sunnali ending north of the Bell Alliance Platz, from the south ending near the Potsdamer Platz and from the north ending near the Reichstag. The Reichstag, the Moltke Bridge, Alexanderplatz, and the Havel bridges at Spandau saw the heaviest fighting, with house-to-house -house and hand-to-hand -hand combat. The foreign contingents of the SS fought particularly hard, because they were ideologically motivated and they believed that they would not live if captured. <laughs> <laughs> Battle for the Reichstag In the early hours of 29 April the Soviet Third Shock Army crossed the Moltke Bridge and started to fan out into the surrounding streets and buildings. The initial assaults on buildings, including the Ministry of the Interior, were hampered by the lack of supporting artillery. It was not until the damaged bridges were repaired that artillery could be moved up in support. At four o'clock hours, in the fear bunker, Hitler signed his last will and testament and, shortly afterwards, married Eva Braun. At dawn the Soviets pressed on with their assault in the southeast. After very heavy fighting they managed to capture Gestapo headquarters on Prinz Albrechtstrasse, but a Waffen-SS counterattack forced the Soviets to withdraw from the building. To the southwest the 8th Guards Army attacked north across the Landwehr Canal into the Tiergarten. By the next day, 30 April, the Soviets had solved their bridging problems and with artillery support at 6 o'clock they launched an attack on the Reichstag, but because of German entrenchments and support from 12.8 cm guns 2 km .2 miles away on the roof of the Zoo Flak Tower, in Berlin Zoo, it was not until that evening that the Soviets were able to enter the building. The Reichstag had not been in use since it had burned in February 1933 and its interior resembled a rubble heap more than a government building. The German troops inside made excellent use of this and were heavily entrenched. Fierce room-to-room -room fighting ensued. At that point there was still a large contingent of German soldiers in the basement who launched counter-attacks against the Red Army. On 2 May 1945 the Red Army controlled the building entirely. The famous photo of the two soldiers planting the flag on the roof of the building is a reenactment photo taken the day after the building was taken. To the Soviets the event as represented by the photo became symbolic of their victory demonstrating that the Battle of Berlin, as well as the Eastern Front hostilities as a whole, ended with the total Soviet victory. As the 756th Regiment's commander Zinchenko had stated in his order to battalion commander Neustroyev, the Supreme High Command and the entire Soviet people order you to erect the victory banner on the roof above Berlin. <inaudible> <inaudible> Battle for the center During the early hours of 30 April, Weidling informed Hitler in person that the defenders would probably exhaust their ammunition during the night. Hitler gave him the permission to attempt a breakout through the encircling Red Army lines. That afternoon, Hitler and Braun committed suicide and their bodies were cremated not far from the bunker. In accordance with Hitler's last will and testament, Admiral Karl Donitz became the President of Germany Reichspräsident in the new Flensburg government, and Joseph Goebbels became the new Chancellor of Germany Reichskanzler. As the perimeter shrank and the surviving defenders fell back, they became concentrated into a small area in the city centre. By now there were about 10,000 German soldiers in the city center, which was being assaulted from all sides. One of the other main thrusts was along Wilhelmstrasse on which the air ministry, built of reinforced concrete, was pounded by large concentrations of Soviet artillery. The remaining German Tiger tanks of the Hermann von Salza battalion took up positions in the east of the Tiergarten to defend the center against Kuznetsov's Third Shock Army which although heavily engaged around the Reichstag was also flanking the area by advancing through the northern Tiergarten and the Eighth Guards Army advancing through the south of the Tiergarten. These Soviet forces had effectively cut the sausage-shaped area held by the Germans in half and made any escape attempt to the west for German troops in the center much more difficult. During the early hours of the 1st of May, Krebs talked to General Chuikov, commander of the Soviet 8th Guards Army, informing him of Hitler's death and a willingness to negotiate a citywide surrender. They could not agree on terms because of Soviet insistence on unconditional surrender and Krebs claimed that he lacked authorization to agree to that. Goebbels was against surrender. In the afternoon, Goebbels and his wife killed their children and then themselves. 
Goebbels's death removed the last impediment which prevented Weidling from accepting the terms of unconditional surrender of his garrison, but he chose to delay the surrender until the next morning to allow the planned breakout to take place under the cover of darkness. Topic. Breakout and surrender On the night of 1 half May, most of the remnants of the Berlin garrison attempted to break out of the city center in three different directions. Only those that went west through the Tiergarten and crossed the Charlottenbrück a bridge over the Havel into Spandau succeeded in breaching Soviet lines. Only a handful of those who survived the initial breakout made it to the lines of the Western Allies. Most were either killed or captured by the Red Army's outer encirclement forces west of the city. Early in the morning of 2 May, the Soviets captured the Reich Chancellery. General Weidling surrendered with his staff at 6 o'clock hours. He was taken to see General Vasily Chuikov at 8.23, where Weidling ordered the city's defenders to surrender to the Soviets. The 350-strong garrison of the Zhu Flak Tower left the building. There was sporadic fighting in a few isolated buildings where some SS troops still refused to surrender, but the Soviets reduced such buildings to rubble. Topic. Battle outside Berlin At some point on 28 April or 29 April, General Gothard Heinrichi, commander-in-chief of Army Group Vistula, was relieved of his command after disobeying Hitler's direct orders to hold Berlin at all costs and never order a retreat, and was replaced by General Kurt Student. General Kurt von Tippelskirch was named as Heinrichi's interim replacement until Student could arrive and assume control. There remains some confusion as to who was in command, as some references say that Student was captured by the British and never arrived. Regardless of whether von Tippelskirch or Student was in command of Army Group Vistula, the rapidly deteriorating situation that the Germans faced meant that Army Group Vistula's coordination of the armies under its nominal command during the last few days of the war was of little significance. On the evening of 29 April, Krebs contacted General Alfred Jodl Supreme Army Command by radio, request immediate report. Firstly of the whereabouts of Wink's spearheads. Secondly of time intended to attack. Thirdly of the location of the Ix Army. Fourthly of the precise place in which the Ix Army will break through. Fifthly of the whereabouts of General Rudolf Holst's spearhead. In the early morning of 30 April, Jodl replied to Krebs, Firstly, Wink's spearhead bogged down south of Schwilo Lake. Secondly, the Twelve Army therefore unable to continue attack on Berlin. Thirdly, bulk of the Ix Army surrounded. Fourthly, Holst's corps on the defensive. Topic. North While the 1st Belarusian Front and the 1st Ukrainian Front encircled Berlin, and started the battle for the city itself, Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front started his offensive to the north of Berlin. On 20 April between Stettin and Schwedt, Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front attacked the northern flank of Army Group Vistula, held by the 3 Panzer Army. By the 22nd of April, the Second Belarusian Front had established a bridgehead on the east bank of the Oder that was over 15 kilometers (9 miles) deep and was heavily engaged with the Three Panzer Army. On the 25th of April, the Second Belarusian Front broke through Three Panzer Army's line around the bridgehead south of Stettin, crossed the Randobrik Swamp, and were now free to move west towards Montgomery's British 21st Army Group and north towards the Baltic port of Stralsund. The German Three Panzer Army and the German 21 Army, situated to the north of Berlin, retreated westwards under relentless pressure from Rokossovsky's Second Belarusian Front, and was eventually pushed into a pocket 32 kilometers (20 miles) wide that stretched from the Elbe to the coast. To their west was the British 21st Army Group which on 1 May broke out of its Elbe bridgehead and had raced to the coast capturing Wismar and Lübeck, to their east Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front and to the south was the United States 9th Army which had penetrated as far east as Ludwigslust and Schwerin. South The successes of the 1st Ukrainian Front during the first nine days of the battle meant that by 25 April, they were occupying large swathes of the area south and southwest of Berlin. Their spearheads had met elements of the 1st Belarusian Front west of Berlin, completing the investment of the city. Meanwhile, the 58th Guards Rifle Division of the 5th Guards Army in 1st Ukrainian Front made contact with the 69th Infantry Division United States of the United States 1st Army near Torgo, on the Elbe River. 
These maneuvers had broken the German forces south of Berlin into three parts. The German Ix army was surrounded in the Halb pocket. Wenck's 12th Army, obeying Hitler's command of of April, was attempting to force its way into Berlin from the southwest but met stiff resistance from 1st Ukrainian Front around Potsdam. Schorner's Army Group Center was forced to withdraw from the Battle of Berlin, along its lines of communications towards Czechoslovakia. Between 24 April and 1 May, the Ix Army fought a desperate action to break out of the pocket in an attempt to link up with the 12th Army. Hitler assumed that after a successful breakout from the pocket, the Ix Army could combine forces with the 12th Army and would be able to relieve Berlin. There is no evidence to suggest that Generals Heinrichi, Buss, or Wenck thought that this was even remotely strategically feasible, but Hitler's agreement to allow the Ix Army to break through Soviet lines allowed many German soldiers to escape to the West and surrender to the United States Army. At dawn on 28 April, the youth divisions Clausewitz, Scharnhorst, and Theodor Corner attacked from the southwest toward the direction of Berlin. They were part of Wenck's 20th Corps and were made up of men from the officer training schools, making them some of the best units the Germans had in reserve. They covered a distance of about 24 kilometers 15 miles, before being halted at the tip of Lake Schwilo, southwest of Potsdam and still 32 kilometers 20 miles from Berlin. During the night, General Wenck reported to the German Supreme Army Command in Furstenberg that his 12th Army had been forced back along the entire front. According to Wenck, no attack on Berlin was possible. At that point, support from the Ix Army could no longer be expected. In the meantime, about 25,000 German soldiers of the Ix Army, along with several thousand civilians, succeeded in reaching the lines of the 12th Army after breaking out of the Halb pocket. The casualties on both sides were very high. Nearly 30,000 Germans were buried after the battle in the cemetery at Halb. About 20,000 soldiers of the Red Army also died trying to stop the breakout, most are buried at a cemetery next to the Baruth Zossen Road. These are the known dead, but the remains of more who died in the battle are found every year, so the total of those who died will never be known. Nobody knows how many civilians died but it could have been as high as 10,000. Having failed to break through to Berlin, Wenck's 12th Army made a fighting retreat back towards the Elbe and American lines after providing the Ix Army survivors with surplus transport. By 6 May many German army units and individuals had crossed the Elbe and surrendered to the U.S. 9th Army. Meanwhile, the 12 Army's bridgehead, with its headquarters in the park of Schönhausen, came under heavy Soviet artillery bombardment and was compressed into an area 8 by 2 kilometers 5 by 1 and a quarter miles. Topic. Surrender On the night of 2–3 May, General Hasso von Mantufel, commander of the 3 Panzer Army along with General Kurt von Tippelskirch, commander of the 21 Army, surrendered to the U.S. Army. Von Sacken's 2 Army, that had been fighting northeast of Berlin in the Vistula Delta, surrendered to the Soviets on 9 May. On the morning of 7 May, the perimeter of the 12 Army's bridgehead began to collapse. Wenck crossed the Elbe under small arms fire that afternoon and surrendered to the American 9th Army. Aftermath According to Grigory Krivoshev's work based on declassified archival data, Soviet forces sustained 81,116 dead for the entire operation, which included the battles of Silo Heights and the Halb. Another 280,251 were reported wounded or sick during the operational period. The operation also cost the Soviets about 1,997 tanks and springs. Krivoshev noted, "...all losses of arms and equipment are counted as irrecoverable losses, i.e. beyond economic repair are no longer serviceable." Soviet estimates based on kill claims placed German losses at 458,080 killed and 479,298 captured, but German research puts the number of dead at approximately 92,000 to 100,000. The number of civilian casualties is unknown, but 125,000 are estimated to have perished during the entire operation. In those areas that the Red Army had captured and before the fighting in the center of the city had stopped, the Soviet authorities took measures to start restoring essential services. Almost all transport in and out of the city had been rendered inoperative, and bombed out sewers had contaminated the city's water supplies. The Soviet authorities appointed local Germans to head each city block, and organized the cleaning up. 
The Red Army made a major effort to feed the residents of the city. Most Germans, both soldiers and civilians, were grateful to receive food issued at Red Army soup kitchens, which began on Colonel General Nikolai Brzezaran's orders. After the capitulation the Soviets went house to house, arresting and imprisoning anyone in a uniform including firemen and railwaymen. During and immediately following the assault, in many areas of the city, vengeful Soviet troops often rear echelon units engaged in mass rape, pillage and murder. Oleg Bednitsky, historian at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, told a BBC radio program that Red Army soldiers were astounded when they reached Germany. For the first time in their lives, eight million Soviet people came abroad, the Soviet Union was a closed country. All they knew about foreign countries was there was unemployment, starvation and exploitation. And when they came to Europe they saw something very different from Stalinist Russia, especially Germany. They were really furious, they could not understand why being so rich, Germans came to Russia. Despite Soviet efforts to supply food and rebuild the city, starvation remained a problem. In June 1945, one month after the surrender, the average Berliner was getting only 64% of a daily ration of 1,240 calories 5,200 kilojoules. Across the city over a million people were without homes. Commemoration 1,100,000 Soviet personnel who took part in the capture of Berlin from the 22nd of April to the 2nd of May 1945 were awarded with the medal for the capture of Berlin. The design of the victory banner to be used for celebrations of the Soviet Victory Day was defined by a federal law of Russia on the 7th of May 2007. This design matches the flag that was raised on the Reichstag with the hammer and sickle, and the inscription, Poland's official flag day is held each year on 2 May, the last day of the battle in Berlin, when the Polish army hoisted its flag on the Berlin Victory Column. See also Siege of Breslau German Instrument of Surrender and Berlin Declaration 1945. German World War II strongholds Mikhail Minin Panzerbar Soviet war crimes Stund Null Notes References Antill, Peter 2005, Berlin 1945 Osprey, ISBN 978 one 84176 915 8 Bivor, Antony the 1st of May 2002. They raped every German female from 8 to 80. The Guardian, archived from the original on 5 October 2008, retrieved 13 September 2008, Bivor, Antony 2002, Berlin, The Downfall 1945, Viking Penguin Books, ISBN 978-0-670-03041-5 Bivor, Antony 2003, Berlin, The Downfall 1945, Penguin Books, ISBN 978-0-14-028696-0 Bellamy, Chris 2007, Absolute War, Soviet Russia in the Second World War, Alfred A. Knopf, ISBN 978-0-375-41086-4 Bergstrom, Christer 2007, Bagration to Berlin, The Final Air Battles in the East, 1944-1945, Ian Allen, ISBN 978-1-903223-91-8 Bednitsky, Oleg. The 3rd of May 2015. Interview. The Rape of Berlin. Broadcast by Ash, Lucy, BBC Radio 4. Bullock, Allen. 1962. Hitler: A Study in Tyranny. Penguin Books. ISBN 9780140135640. Claudfelter, Michael. 2002. Warfare and Armed Conflicts: A Statistical Reference to Casualty and Other Figures. 1500 to 2000. Second ed. 
McFarland and Company, ISBN 978-0-7864-1204-4 Dollinger, Hans The Decline and Fall of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, New York, Bonanza Books, ISBN 978-0517013137 Duffy, Christopher Red Storm on the Reich, Routledge, ISBN 978-0-415-03589-7 Fisher, Thomas 2008, Soldiers of the Liebstandarte, J. J. Fedorovich Publishing, ISBN 978-0-921991-91-5 Gariev, Mokhmet, Trediak, Ivan, Urs Heshevsky, Oleg the 21st of July 2005, Interviewed by Sergei Turchenko, Nasili Nad Fakthami Abuse of Facts, Trude in Russian Glantz, David M. 1998, When Titans Clashed, How the Red Army Stopped Hitler, University Press of Kansas, ISBN ISBN 978-0-7006-0899-7 Glantz, David M. The 11th of October 2001, The Soviet-German War 1941-1945, Myths and Realities, a survey essay, the Strom Thurmond Institute, archived from the original on 18 February 2015 Gregory, Don A., Galen, William R. 2009, Two Soldiers, Two Lost Fronts, German War Diaries of the Stalingrad and North Africa Campaigns Illustrated ed., Case Mate Publishers, pp. 207, 208, ISBN 978-1-935149-05-7 Grossman, Atina 2009, Jews, Germans, and Allies, Close Encounters in Occupied Germany, Princeton University Press, ISBN 978-0-691-14317-0 Hamilton, A. Stefan 2008, Bloody Streets, The Soviet Assault on Berlin, April 1945, Helion & Co., ISBN 978-1-906033-12-5 Hastings, Max 2004, Armageddon, The Battle for Germany, 1944-1945 Macmillan, ISBN 978-0-333-90836-5 Hastings, Max 2005, Armageddon, The Battle for Germany, 1944-1945 Pan, ISBN 978-0-330-49062-7 Isayev, Alexei the 26th of July 2010, Silo Heights, Price of Victory, Interview in Russian, interviewed by Vitaly Dymarsky, Moscow, Echo of Moscow, retrieved December 2012, Ketchum, M. The 6th of December 2014, The WW2 Letters of Private Melvin W. Johnson, Ketchetera, retrieved December 2014, Komarovsky, Krzysztof, 2009, Boj Polsky 1939 to 1945, Shavodnik Encyklopedichny, Moscow Bureau Baden Historic Poland. Bologna, pp. 65-67, ISBN 978-83-7399-353-2, retrieved 12 May 2011 Krivashiv, G.F. Soviet Casualties and Combat Losses in the 20th Century, Greenhill Books, ISBN 978-1-85367-280-4 Kutalowski, Denny the 21st of November 2011, Polish Holidays, Polish Toledo Lavrenov, Sergei, Popov, Igor, 2000, Kra Tretego Regia The Fall of the Third Reich in Russian, Moscow, ACT, ISBN 5 237 05065 4. Tony, 2005, Slaughter at Halb, Sutton, ISBN 978 0 7509 3689 7. Lewis, John E., 1998, The Mammoth Book of Eyewitness History, PGW, ISBN 978 0 7867 05 3 4, 4 McGuinness, Edgar 1946, The War, 6, Oxford University Press Millward, Allen S. 1980, War, Economy and Society, 1939-1945, University of California Press, ISBN 978-0-520-03942-1 Muller, Rolf Dieter 2008, Das Deutsche Reich und der Zweite Weltkrieg, Band 10 over 1, Der Zusammenbruch des Deutschen Reiches 1945 und die Folge Again, Day Zweiten Weltkrieges, Thiel BD1, Die Militarische Niederwerfung der Wehrmacht in German, Deutsche Verlags Anstalt, ISBN 978-3-421-06237-6 Murray, Williamson, Millet, Alan Reed, 2000, A War to Be Won, Harvard University Press, ISBN 978-0-674-00680-5 RAF Staff, the 13th of March 2006, RAF History, Bomber Command 60th Anniversary, RAF, Archived from 
the original on the 28th of July 2012. Retrieved April 2012. Federal Nizikan Rasijskij Federacy I 07 Ma 2007 G. N 68 F's O Zinameni Pobedi Federal Law of the Russian Federation dated May 7, 2007 N 68 F Z on the banner of victory in Russian R G dot R U the 8th of May 2007 archived from the original on the 19th of May 2011 retrieved June 2011 Ryan Cornelius 1966 The Last Battle Simon and Schuster ISBN 9780671406400 Oers Heshevsky Oleg A 2002, Berlin Ska Operation 1945 G. Discussion Protolzits of the Berlin Operation of 1945, discussion continues, Mir I Story World of History in Russian 4. Simons, Gerald 1982, Victory in Europe, Time Life Books, ISBN 978-0-8094-3406-0. Sontimer, Michael the 7th of May 2008. Iconic Red Army Reichstag photo faked. Spiegel Online, archived from the original on the 13th of September 2008, retrieved the 13th of September 2008. Tiemann, Ralph, 1998, The Liebstandarte IV, 2, JJ. Fedorovich Publishing, ISBN 9780921991403. Wagner, Ray 1974, The Soviet Air Force in World War II, The Official History, Doubleday White, Osmer 2003, Conqueror's Road, An Eyewitness Report of Germany 1945, Cambridge University Press, ISBN 978-0-521-53751-3 Williams, Andrew 2005, D-Day to Berlin, Hodder, ISBN 978-0-340-83397-1 Zaloga, Stephen J. 1982, the Polish Army, 1939-45, Osprey Publishing Zimka, Earl F. 1969, Battle for Berlin End of the Third Reich Ballantine's Illustrated History of World War II Battle Book No. 6, Ballantine Books Zimka, Earl F. 1990, Chapter 17 Zone and Sector the U.S. Army in the Occupation of Germany 1944-1946, Washington, D.C., Center of Military History, United States Army, Library of Congress Catalog Card No. 75-619027 Ziemke, Earl F. 1983. Germany and World War II, The Official History? Central European History, 16 4, 398-407, doi, 10.1017, s0008938900001266 Ralph, the 1st of July 2003, Battle for the Silo Heights, Part 2, archived from the original on 25 May 2011 originally published in World War II at Suite101.com on 1 May 1999. Revised edition published in Articles on War at Onward.com on 1 July 2003. Further reading Antill, P. Battle for Berlin, April to May 1945 includes the Order of Battle for the Battle for Berlin, Letitia, T. 1988, The Battle of Berlin 1945, London, Jonathan Cape. Dury, W. 2012, the British Garrison Berlin 1945-1994, Nowhere to Go, Berlin, Vergangenheits, Berlin, ISBN 978-3-86408-068-5 Emprick, Bruce E. 2017, Onward to Berlin, Red Army Valor in World War II, The Full Cavaliers of the Soviet Order of Glory, Teufelsburg Press, ISBN 978-1973498605 Erickson, John The Road to Berlin, Continuing the History of Stalin's War with Germany, Westview Press, ISBN 978-0-89158-795-8 Anonymous, A Woman in Berlin, Six Weeks in the Conquered City translated by Anthes Bell, ISBN 978-0-8050-7540-3 Kuby, Eric 1968, The Russians and Berlin, 1945, Hill and Wong 
Moeller, Robert G. 1997, West Germany Under Construction, University of Michigan Press, ISBN 978-0-472-06648-3 Nymark, Norman M. 1995, the Russians in Germany, A History of the Soviet Zone of Occupation, 1945–1949, Cambridge, Belknap, ISBN 978-0-674-78405-5 Reed, Anthony, Fisher, David 1993, The Fall of Berlin, London, Pimlico, ISBN 978-0-7126-0695-0 Sanders, Ian J., Photos of World War II Berlin Locations Today, archived from the original on 14 October 2007 Shepardson, Donald E. 1998. The Fall of Berlin and the Rise of a Myth. The Journal of Military History, 62 1, 135–153 Tillman, Rema, The Battle for Berlin in World War II, BBC White, Osmer, By the Eyes of a War Correspondent, archived from the original on 18 March 2007 — Alternative Account of Crimes Against Civilians RT TV Network, official channel on YouTube, Fall of Berlin, Stopping the Nazi Heart on YouTube, 27 June 2010. 26-minute video.